Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Uh, delegates, thanks for inviting me here today to speak to you on economic, social and cultural rights. Um, and what I propose to do over the next 15 minutes is just firstly begin by defining what exactly are ESC, economic, social, cultural rights, exploring some of the state duties of ESC rights, looking at subconstitutional protection, mainly legislative protection of economic, social, cultural rights in Irish law and practice, before then looking at the systems that are in place internationally and domestically for protecting um, and adjudicating upon ESC rights. So let's be, what exactly, what precisely are economic, social and cultural rights? Well, let's start off with economic rights. Um, these generally include rights to work, trade union rights, fair conditions of employment, and also property rights, peaceful enjoyment of your property. And they're the main rights protected under economic rights, um, uh, under this e ESC definition. For social rights, issues like the right to food, right to shelter, right to education, healthcare, um, adequate standard of living, social security and social assistance, um, and the right for families to be protected um, adequately. They are seen as social and economic rights, so generally rights in adequate standard of living. And we then finally have cultural rights. Now, these include the right to participate um, in the culture of one's communities and enjoy the benefits of scientific um, and technological endeavour. Ethnic, religious um, and linguistic minorities also have a right to practice their own culture, faith and language. So that, in essence, is what I'm speaking about when I refer to ESC, economic, social and cultural rights. Now, it's probably fair to say not all these rights can be neatly categorised into either as economic rights, social rights or cultural rights. They'll all cross-cut into each other. Um, and also, other rights, rights such as civil and political rights, may also impact upon, uh, may also impact upon the enjoyment of, so, uh, of economic, social and cultural rights. For example, rights to food, healthcare, adequate standard of living, can they not be engaged by the right to life, the prohibition on inhuman and degrading treatment, um, the right to private and family life, and a number of our other civil and political rights? And we have seen a growing realisation and uh, I, I suppose a growing uh, or different approaches by different courts, for example, the European Court of Human Rights has recently begun to um, interpret ESC rights, rights adequate, shelter, food, as being part of the European Convention on Human Rights. Very limited circumstances, but nevertheless, there has been a recognition that there's no clear divide between, you know, inhuman, uh, prohibition of inhuman degrading treatment or right to life with other economic, social and cultural rights. So I've listed all these protections. They don't come from my head. Where they come from are... Um, mainly our obligations under international, Ireland's obligations under international, European, um, and also domestic law. So we have obligations under international law. Um, this mainly includes the International Covenant on, e on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights, so a UN um, international agreement, which Ireland is a state party to, and other international human rights treaties that protect the rights of children, women, etc. We have obligations under European law, that includes not only your, that includes European Union law, such as the EU Charter of Fundamental Rights and certain directives that, um, uh, that promote respect for rights to work, um, and also Council of Europe law, um, or European uh, Social Charter and the European Convention on Human Rights. And we also have ESC rights under national law. And these are both under the Constitution, something that Dr. David Fenley will speak, um, right, uh, speak um, to you about right after me. And what I will focus on is legislation, the ESE rights protected under legislation in Ireland. So that's where economic, social, cultural rights come from. They're part of our international obligations, part of our European legal obligations, and also part of our domestic legal obligations. <clears throat> and these rights and duties then, there's, <clears throat> excuse me, there's an understanding of how those rights and duties are protected under international um, law. And looking in particular at the main UN 
Convention on Protection of Economic, Social and Cultural Rights. States have duties to respect, protect and fulfil ESE rights. The duty to respect, well, this is basically a duty on the state to respect the ability of individuals to provide for themselves. State not interfering in individuals' ability to provide themselves with their economic, social and cultural rights. So states must refrain from engaging in acts or omissions that violate ESC rights, such as placing unlimited, lim unreasonable limitations on exercising the right to work, um, or eviction of families unfairly from their homes. So duties, uh, the state rather must ensure that they respect the ability of individuals to fulfill their own economic, social, cultural rights. States also have an obligation to protect <clears throat> there must be, the state must adopt positive measures that protect rights holders from interference by both state actors and non-state actors. Um, this might, for example, include passing laws that protect employees from exploitative employment practices or enable redress and rather, and enable redress of ESC rights if your economic, social or cultural rights are violated. So putting in place mechanisms by which individuals can um, access courts or tribunals and say that their, for example, employment rights have been violated. And the final duty then is a duty to fulfil. And this includes an obligation on the state to promote economic, social and cultural rights. So, the state has to put in place comprehensive legislative and policy reviews so as to ensure individuals are aware of, have access to, um, and can rely upon their economic, social and cultural rights. There is an obligation to facilitate ESC rights, such as the state adopting legal, economic or social policies that strengthen ESC, economic, social and cultural rights. Um, and that also includes putting in place systems to enable individuals or to rather systems to adjudicate upon whether an individual has had their economic, social or cultural right violated. And the final duty under this duty or obligation to fulfil is that in certain situations, states will have to provide um, for ESC rights to ensure the right to food, shelter, adequate standard of living, healthcare, um, etc., are all protected. But this interna international obligation, it's a duty to progressively realise. Um, so states must progressively realise um, those economic, social and cultural rights that I spoke to you about earlier. Um, this doesn't mean that the states can simply use this duty to progressively realise ESC rights um, to simply say, oh, we will meet them at some time in the very distant future. But states must work as quickly and effectively as possible to protect ESE rights. And the state must do this to the maximum of, of available resources. Um, and this relates to the totality of resources available. Not simply the resources states may seem, oh, we'd like to have that available, so we will fund usually military, um, you know, the funding of military, but we'll ignore education or right to health. Um, it, it's a, a clear obligation under international law that the maximum of available resources means totality of resources available. <clears throat> but these, obligation, these, um, these obligations to progressively realise and maximum available resources, um, they do not appear in other treaties that, for example, Ireland has, has signed and ratified, in particular the Convention on the Rights of the Child and the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women. Um, so this duty to, uh, and also this duty to progressively realise and uh, to the maximum available resources does not appear in other European um, legal instruments. <clears throat> so the state cannot rely, cannot say that we will progressively realise to the maximum of our available resources um, where the rights of child or rights of women are at issue. There needs to be exceptionally strong justifications in withdrawing or diminishing economic, social and cultural rights under international um, and European law. Um, and also, another key duty 
in terms of achieving economic, social and cultural rights is that of e equality and non-discrimination. States can only distinguish the enjoyment of economic, social and cultural rights for individuals, provided that those distinctions are reasonable, legitimate or proportionate. So what does that mean? Well, let's take, for example, the right to work. A state could not put in place, um, could not put in place restrictions on an individual entering the work workforce because of their race or ethnicity. But they can put in place restrictions where um, it has to do with educational qualification or professional training. So the protection of economic, social and cultural rights when the international field, Ireland has signed up to international obligations, um, which they have a duty and an obligation to realise. David will speak to you about constitutional rights, but how do we, or rather, how does the state protect economic, social, cultural rights at the legisl legislative level? Well, first of all, I, I, I have a few warnings here. This is not a systematic evaluation of the adequacy or inadequacy of the legislative protection of economic, social, cultural rights. Um, I'm mainly focusing on legislation. Um, I am not saying whether we are meeting our obligations or not under international or European law. So how does Irish law protect economic rights? We'll begin with economic rights. Well, property rights, they're protected under the Constitution, also in various, um, in various ways under legislation. But of course, there's limitations to this, for example, planning laws. Because you have a right to property doesn't mean that you can, um, or you have your own property, your peaceful enjoyment of property and um, planning laws does, do not impact on that peaceful enjoyment. The right to work and minimum conditions um, of employment. Um, well, the state has in place um, <clears throat> legislation on the minimum wage. It has health and safety um, legislation in place. And also minimum, other minimum conditions of employment, of employee rights legislation, and also um, mechanisms by which an employee can, decide, can um, have any grievance um, tested before a tribunal, before the labour court, or before the regular courts. But there are limitations on the right to work. For example, it's a criminal offence for those seeking asylum in the state to seek, employ to seek and enter employment. So these are the economic rights that are protected legislatively. Social rights that are protected legislatively, well, the welfare state. <clears throat> Once again, I'm not saying whether we are meeting our international and European obligations, but there, is a leg there are legislative provisions that ensure individuals can enjoy social security and social assistance payments. Carers allowance, child benefit, old age pension, family income supplement. Um, these are all protected under Irish law, under Irish legislation. Um, and similar as regards other social rights, right, medical cards, i.e. accessing right to health, housing, including traveller accommodation, landlord and tenant protections, the mutual rights and obligations of landlord and tenant. These are all provided for under, um, under legislation. Cultural rights. How does Ireland protect cultural rights, either legislatively, through administrative practice, or through some other forms of practice? Well, there's support monetarily or in kind from museums, cultural events, scientific, and other research that the state makes available. Um, there's protections um, as regards religion and rights to practice religion. And there's protection of languages, including constitutional recognition of the Irish language. And there's also equality legislation and incitement to ha hatred legislation in place that can in particular, in particular protect cultural, ethnic um, uh, minorities. So with this protection of ESC rights at the international and at the domestic level, how do people ensure that their ESC rights can be vindicated? Well, there are systems of adjudicating, uh, for adjudicating economic, social, cultural rights. Once again, um, there's a number, of, um, a number of provisos that have to go, in, to go with discussing this adjudicate, um, the systems and processes in place for um, adjudicating economic, social, cultural rights. For example, in the international European system, there, there are judicial mechanisms um, wh whereby they do assess um, whether 
Ireland meets, in essence, economic, social and cultural rights. For example, the European Court of Human Rights has in the past, in one particular case, in relation to access to justice, has has found Ireland violated the right to access to justice. That necessarily has monetary implications to ensure Ireland um, protects individuals' right to access justice. And the Court of Justice of the European Union, that's the EU court, um, that, that um, has found that Ireland may have certain, socio there might be socioeconomic rights implications as regards our asylum system and not returning asylum seekers to certain countries, in this case, Greece. And there's also monitoring or, super, or supervisory mechanisms. There's the UN Committee on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights and also the European Committee on Social Rights. Um, and they will basically determine, they will give a, a determination as to whether Ireland is meeting international obligations under, um, under our various, um, the various treaties that we have signed and ratified. So they're the international systems whereby socioeconomic rights can be um, adjudicated, um, adjudicated upon. How then at the domestic level do we adjudicate on economic, social, cultural rights? The courts. Um, there have, and this is just a, a, a one particular example, um, Irish courts do play a role in determining, even implicitly, whether there's violations of economic, social and cultural rights. There's cases in two, from 2007 and 2008 where the Irish High Court held that in on the particular facts of these cases, um, the lack of adequate shelter led to the violation of, um, of individuals' right to private and family life and ordered damages be awarded um, to the, the O'Donnells um, in these cases. Um, and that's so you can access courts to ensure protection of economic, social, cultural rights, um, but it is somewhat limited. And then there's decision-making and appeals processes in place. Um, an individual will apply for, for example, a social security payment, um, job seekers benefit, job seekers allowance, carers allowance if they're um, caring. There'll be a decision-making process. And then if they're not happy with that decision, there's then a, an appeals process to ensure that you can appeal um, and get a review of the initial decision. Um, so, there is a, pro a key problem, I suppose, that can be identified with this is often the decisions are taken as regards to legislative tests, not so much on a rights framework. These decisions are not taken on the basis of economic, social and cultural rights protections. Um, so we have a variety of bodies, social security, social assistance bodies, employment bodies, education if you're refused, um, if you're removed from education or if you're refused access, there can be certain appeals rights. And we also do have some other bodies um, like the Ombudsman's Office who looks at maladministration in the state. And then the Ombudsman for Children, the Irish Human Rights Commission would, would to, to an extent, to an extent, would largely take into account a rights, um, a rights approach to determining um, certain issues, uh, certain limited issues of economic, social and cultural rights. So we have these bodies that ensure um, that individuals can rely on their legislative economic, social, cultural rights. But as I said, sometimes these mechanis mechanisms do not fully um, adopt a rights framework in de determining um, whether an individual's economic, social, cultural right has been met. So I hope that has somewhat clarified, firstly, what what are economic, social, cultural rights? Where are our obligations, uh, where the state's obligations on ESE rights come from? And then finally, the systems and processes for adjudicating upon economic, social, and cultural rights. Thank you.